Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, discussing the cutting edge in health, nutrition, and functional medicine. To make sure you're up to date on this and other important topics, visit drruscio.com and sign up to receive weekly updates. That's D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com. The following discussion is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first speaking with your doctor. Now, let's head to the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio. This is Dr. Ruscio. Today, I am here with Dr. Tanya Dempsey, and we are going to be talking about mast cell activation syndrome and, I guess, its distant cousin potentially histamine intolerance. And we've had a few episodes on this previously, but um, I'm really excited about this conversation uh, because we have a a very skilled and experienced clinician who can give us a a good narrative on the issue from an experiential perspective. So uh, Dr. Dempsey, um, I'm really happy to have you on the show and, and welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you tell people just in brief kind of your 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 background and how you got into the focus of MCAS? Yeah, so I think you know, I think it's um an interesting journey that I've been on as a as a physician. I I really come from a traditional background. You know, I went to Johns Hopkins Medical School, went the you know, traditional allopathic route, and um, and then really became dissatisfied with what I was uh, doing uh, and how I wasn't really feeling like I was helping the patients. And so over time, my my practice transitioned into a more integrative approach. And I'll and I'll be honest with you, I, I think that I've always been uh, on some level doing integrative medicine. It's how I think about things. I always question why things happen. I always want to look at root causes. I've been doing that before I was even a doctor. But over time, it became clear to me that I was sort of thinking about things in one way, but then practicing medicine in another because of the way that medicine is uh, is taught and, and, um, and the way we were kind of made to practice, right? You have to follow the rules. You have to follow algorithms and things like that. And over time, it was getting very frustrating because I couldn't really do what I wanted to do. And so I realized that I was really, you know, very interested in integrative medicine and took, took that route into that functional medicine integrative world. World. And I started my practice, Ormonk Integrative Medicine, in, in 2011. And my whole thing was about I really wanted to treat the patient. I wanted to, have, to provide personalized care. And I wanted to help patients understand why they're sick. And over time, in the, Latin, the first few years of practice, you know, I was you know, helping patients you know, um, learning more and more about how to work patients up for various disorders. And I had a patient who was um, really a, a tough case. And, and I know your audience will understand that, you know, there are lots of us that, uh, you know, that, that treat patients who are really sick and no one can figure out what's going on. And I had such a patient who was really a great partner with me. And I, and I always emphasize a, a partnership with my patients. And we try to explore all the different things that have been going on and try to figure out why she was going down a path and we couldn't figure out what that path was, where it was leading and why it was going that, that direction. And so we started exploring different things. And she was having a variety of different symptoms that at the time were considered, I guess, weird, a little bit unusual. But now I know that it's not unusual and I have many patients with the same, but you know, she would be very reactive to various anti Antibiotics. She had a whole list of things that she knew she couldn't take as far as medications. She knows that she had tried some herbs and had difficulties with that. She was having these episodes of what she called asthma, but um, it wasn't really didn't meet the criteria for asthma, according to the pulmonologist. So we knew there were some breathing issues. She was having a lot of digestive issues and bloating and and diarrhea. And so we knew that there were there was a lot of things going on. And and you know in the integrative functional medicine world, we would look at. Uh, leaky gut, and we would look at um, inflammation. And so we were doing all those things, but we weren't really getting anywhere. And um, and I had come across, I had been doing some research, and I had come across uh, an article about this condition called mast cell activation syndrome. And it, you know, I got chills reading it, and I thought, I think we're on, I think this is it. And this was probably about four or five years ago at this point, and it was just, you know, really starting to gain some ground. People were starting to talk about it, but it was still very limited information that we had. And, um, you know, I told her what I was thinking, and she, through some connections, uh, found that uh, Dr. Lawrence Afrin was the world's expert in this condition, and she asked if I would 
reach out to him and talk to him and, um, you know, see what, you know, what he thinks. And so we started a dialogue and, and uh, I learned a tremendous amount from him. And he subsequently joined my practice um, about a year ago. So it's been amazing working with him. Uh, but I learned a lot from him and then I started doing my own research. And sure enough, uh, no question about it, she had that condition, mast cell activation syndrome. And it really just takes that one patient for you to realize that this is bigger than you can imagine. This is not one patient. I probably have a whole clinic of patients just like this who are getting better, you know, with, with a lot of the things that we're doing to support their immune system and, and to help their diet. And, and we're doing all the things that we should be doing, but we're still missing something. This is probably what is what's affecting them. And so I started, you know, one by one, reevaluating a lot of these patients and realizing that, yeah, in fact, probably 80 to 90% of my patients have this condition. Uh, and then that was all it took. So, you know, four years later, it's, it's, it's a big part of my practice. And I work towards, you know, learning more about it, researching. And Dr. Afrin and I have, you know, some initiatives that we're, we're hoping will, uh, you know, help lots of patients in the future. So that's my, my background. All right. Well, it, it's a good background and uh, yeah, it's um, interesting to see how we end up in, in different clinical niches based upon, I guess, the patient populations that we're trying to serve. And uh, I love the fact that you kept digging and looking for a deeper answer. And, and that's a nice transition to, as we start into this discussion, I, I think patients and clinicians alike are trying to answer the question in their own head you know, how do I know if this is me or if this is a patient that I'm working with? And part of what I, I look at is this, this spectrum I have in my head, you know, whether or not it's, it's very logical or, or able to be substantiated or not, I guess is another conversation. But the, the syndrome of, of histamine intolerance seems to have some commonality with mast cell activation syndrome. And it, it, it does seem that some of these histamine-like symptoms that are multi-system presentations like there is in mast cell activation syndrome can be very well managed, you know, as you alluded to, with especially with, with dietary and gut-based therapies, uh, but they don't work well for everyone. And, and so there are some people that seem to just not really respond fully to interventions that for other people would be totally sufficient to obtain a level of improvement that we're looking for. So do you see that kind of spectrum in your head? And, and do you have any, I guess, thoughts from that big picture of trying to ascertain, you know, when someone may be able to ameliorate their symptoms with more basic therapies and when they need to consider looking at MCAS specifically? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, before I wound up in that, in the mast cell world, I, my interest was in histamine intolerance and and um, and methylation disorders, and those two are also very closely linked. So, you know, initially before I understood that there was this was it was bigger than that, you know, I was treating a lot of these histamine issues through uh, supporting methylation, supporting the gut, right? Those are the ways you deal with histamine primarily, and um, and then you know realize that there's more. But I, I think that you make a good point about this. I think about this too. This is definitely a spectrum illness. And there are people who are walking around with histamine issues, mast cell activation syndrome, who are really not affected by it in any meaningful way. Um, you know, maybe they're on, on occasion, they'll have a symptom that they have to deal with, but generally speaking, it's, it's treatable and it's, it's fleeting. Um, that's one end of the spectrum. And then as you go down, you know, then you have patients who, you know, know if that there's, there are specific foods that are high in histamine or that liberate histamine that they react to. And so for them, you know, it's very clear as long as they avoid those foods and I'll, you know, I'll throw in that, in that bucket, you know, alcohol and, and things like that, they're also high in histamine. They, they know that and they try to avoid it. And as long as they do, they're pretty good. And when they don't, because they know what to expect. And then as you move along, you have a patient who, you know, that they know that part of it, but for some reason there are other illnesses or, or conditions that are presenting themselves that are not uh, ameliorated with, you know, with a, a dietary approach or a supplement approach or, you know, lifestyle approach, there's something else going on. And, um, and then, you know, way at the end, other end of the spectrum are the patients who are very, very disabled from this condition. Um, it's attacked 
impact every organ system in a sense and and their system is is shutting down and and those are the ones that you know you need um, to hit it from all angles there's no question about it. you're not gonna you're not gonna move this you have to um, stabilize the mast cells you got to decrease the histamine levels and you got to dig to the root cause and you got to figure out why they are in that situation. Why has their body, um, you know, broken down to that, to that level. And so, yeah, I, you know, I can intervene at, at any of those points, right. Depending on the patient. Um, so a lot of it is clinical judgment. I mean, you know, when the patient walks in, you know, if it, this is going to be a case where, you know, you might be able to get a handle on it in the cases that are obviously going to be more complex. So, you know, the diet piece, I want to make a, a point about it because I, you know, I definitely talk about histamine and histamine foods and histamine releasing foods in my clinic. And, you know, we give them different lists of, of what they, you know, should consider avoiding. But what I have found is that it's not so much about those lists. I mean, there's some obvious things that will affect most people with histamine issues. However, there, there are idiosyncratic things that happen in the body that are not necessarily explained by the food. So, you know, there are uh, patients who, for instance, eat avocados. Avocados, we've, we've heard that are high in histamine, but I have plenty of mast cell patients or histamine intolerant patients who eat avocados every day and don't have an issue with that. So, you know, a lot of it is this like trial and error with patients and understanding like what it really is about them. That is causing sure. their their issues. Sure. Yeah, I, th- I think that's well said. And and one of the one of the things I I advise my patients on when when they're doing a low histamine diet is this is something that we'll we'll use a bit strict in the short term, but then we want to try to broaden your boundaries because it's not to say that you will be intolerant to every low histamine food on the list. We want to simply use that as a starting point to contract to, and then try to expand to identify you know what your hopefully only handful of trigger foods are. And, and you also make a great point, which is making that, I guess, clinical adjudication of, of when someone will be able to see the response they're looking for with, with some of these more, I guess, preliminary therapies, we could term them. And then when would be the appropriate time to look more to MCAS directly? And I'm wondering what tools, signs, or symptoms, or indicators you use in helping to make that judgment. Now, of course, there there are some, I think, simple basics, people who are otherwise fairly recalcitrant to other therapies and people who tend to be very sensitive. Uh, you know, th- those would be, I think, some some common giveaways. And I've, I've heard from, uh, I believe it was Dr. Carnahan who said that the two most common symptoms that seem to be um, affected by this are neurological and dermatological, so you know, brain fog or mood, and potentially skin you know, rashes or lesions or, or hives or flushing. Um, but you know, what, what would you add to the picture of trying to help people look for some of these indicators that MCAS directly may be something that they should consider? Yeah. So you know, number one, when I see a patient in you know the office and I'm starting my history. I mean, some of them come to me with um, a thought that they, you know, someone has mentioned it to them or they, you know, they read about it. And so they want to know if they have mast cell activation syndrome specifically. But most patients are coming to me because they have been to 50 other doctors and no one else can figure it out. And so they want somebody to, to help them put the picture together. And so I'm, I'm always going to start at the beginning. And I have all my patients begin uh, their history at birth um, and even in utero. So I want to know what their mother was going through when they, when she was pregnant with the patient and what happened at the birth and what happened after. And we go all the way into the future and until I'm mean, into the present, I'm sorry. And we, you know, really, I start to see trends uh, amongst patients with mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, very often there are very early signs in childhood that they may be more reactive. And so, you know, it's not uncommon to hear the history of eczema, history of rashes or hives, a history of allergic reactions to certain medications. So that may be sort of early on in childhood. Um, there often is a family history. We're going through the family history too, and it's not uncommon to see others in the family who have similar similar symptoms at some point in their in their lives. And then and then I'm I'm going, you know, doing a really thorough review of systems and we're going from head to toe. And the one thing I've learned about mass cell elevation syndrome is it can hit every system. So 
yes, you know, I think that Dr. Carhan is right. You know, neurologically, um, it's probably the one, the underappreciated cause of neuropsychiatric disease is mast cell activation syndrome. So you do need to think about it. And, and definitely the skin is sort of obvious because you can see it. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I want to make sure that we understand that there are patients who come to me who do not get rashes. They don't have any skin manifestations at all. I still have to think about this um, because it affects, again, the gut, the respiratory tract, the cardiovascular system. Um, it affects the, um, the liver. It affects the muscles, the joints, the bladder, the urogenital tract, tract. So there's so many things, hormones and endocrine system. And so, you know, what I do is what I, I, I start to, you know, understand that, um, the more systems that are involved, the more likely they are to have mast cell activation syndrome. So if a patient just has hives and rashes and that's it, they have no other symptoms, they have no GI symptoms, they have no respiratory symptoms, they, they probably have some reactive mast cells because that's what causes hives and, and, um, and uh, rashes, but they probably don't have the full spectrum of the syndrome. And you know, most people with the syndrome do have multiple. Uh, it's a multi-system disorder, really. Uh, and that, I think, is important. So we're going through, again, the whole uh, you know, head to toe, all the symptoms and, and their whole history. Uh, and then at the end, I say, you know, there's a flavor to mast cell disease here, and we you know, probably need to explore this further. And, and I, I've gotten to the point where I pretty much screen I screen all my patients now who walk in the door, especially if they don't know what they have and I'm working them up from the beginning. Um, I'm going to screen them for this, not just with my history taking, but I'm also going to do extensive testing because if this is related, I mean, if this is part of their whole picture or you know, part of the whole picture, but not the whole picture, um, I'm going to want to treat this piece because once I, once I under identify this and treat it, it makes such a difference in treating the rest of the issues that they may be dealing with, you know? So I, I have to under identify it. And so we, I usually do, there are very specific blood tests that can be done pretty routinely through, uh, through regular labs. There are some urine tests, both random urine and 24 hour urine collections. And, um, and then in addition, there are some ways to identify mast cells in, um, in biopsies. So if patients have had an endoscopy or a colonoscopy uh, or skin biopsy, if they've had something, some tissue, we can stain it and look for mast cells. So that's pretty much like how I'm going to go about, you know, the workup. And, um, and the blood work, you know, for, for simplicity's sake, there are really three main tests. There, there are more, of course, but there are three main ones that are, I could just use as a screening tool a histamine, chromogranin A level, and a tryptase level. And, um, and, and Dr. Afrin and I have sort of gone over the criteria for diagnosis. And, um, you know, really, if you have two positive markers, two positive what we call mediators from the mast cell, that pretty much supports the diagnosis. Mm, okay. I'm glad to, to hear the, the kind of three component initial screening model because I've also looked at the more in-depth model and I believe that comes to about 24 different markers that, that you would need to go to three or four labs to, to acquire. And, 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 you know, if there's a time and if there's a need for that, I'm, I'm supportive, but it's nice if, if a clinician uh, has, has a, at least starting point. And, and I know that the chromogram in a, is available from from LabCorp, and as is the histamine, and this is the histamine determination in the plasma. Is that specifically the the marker? Uh, oh, and the pro and I'm just looking at my sheet here now. And the prostaglandin is also available via LabCorp. So this the initial screening could exclusively be done via LabCorp, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nice. Oh, I'm sorry. And, the third mark you said um, was tryptase, not the, not the, the front yeah. I'm sorry. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a debate um, out there regarding the tryptase level. And I've started to see it and maybe even controversial for me to comment on it. But I will make a comment because I think it's important because I know there are a lot of patients out there who are really um, uh, dissatisfied with 
with the fact that they can't make a diet, they can't make a diagnosis in them and, and they still don't know what's going on. So there is one school of in the in the mast cell world where they believe that you need the tryptase for the diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome. And then there's the other school, which is sort of where Dr. Afford and I live. Um, and that is, and we believe that the tryptase is not critical for the diagnosis. And tryptase is an interesting Tryptase is an enzyme that's constitutively expressed by all mast cells. And so there's a, there's a condition known as mastocytosis. Mastocytosis is actually like a cancer. It's an um, increased number of mast cells that uh, build up in either certain, in certain organ systems or in the skin. And, um, and in that case, these people have lots of mast cells, and so they will have lots of tryptase. And uh, if you check their tryptase in their blood, they'll have elevated levels. In patients who have mast cell activation syndrome, they don't have more mast cells. They actually have the same number of mast cells they should. They're just more reactive and they're inappropriately reactive. So they don't necessarily have higher levels of tryptase in their blood. What they have is often normal or low levels of tryptase in their blood, but they may have other markers to help support the diagnosis. So, you know, I do screen everybody with a tryptase because I think it's important if you get it, you know, then uh, at a certain level, it may suggest the MCAS diagnosis or it can suggest mastocytosis and that sends them in a, in a little different direction uh, for the workup. But, you know, the point I want to make is that um, I think it's important that we look clinically, we look at the other markers and, you know, to help us with the, with the diagnosis. I'll make one more point because you mentioned briefly this, like a questionnaire or there are other tools you can use to help um, with the diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome. And, and we, in, in our clinic, we do um, have every single patient fill out the questionnaire, and whatever they can't fill out, we fill out with them, the rest, because some of it is a little bit um, more complex and, and more sort of physician lingo than patient lingo, uh, but we're, we're doing that because we're using that questionnaire as not just to help us with diagnosis the patient, but more for research purposes, because, you know, the, the key is really that we need to understand more about this disease. We, we really don't. The more we know, the less we know. So we do need to continue furthering our education on this and furthering the research on this to help more patients. And so I think that questionnaire is really where that com comes in. And with that questionnaire, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in, in the numbers, but I believe it's a high probability of MCAS if the score is above 14 and then between mm -hmm. 10 and 14, it's, it's suggested. Am I right in my numbers? Mm -hmm. and, and, That's and, correct. and so, you know, how, let's say there's a clinician who's, who's new to this and they're trying to make the discrimination as to whether or not they should refer to an MCAS specialist or, or even tinker with, with some of the MCAS treatments. Would you say looking at that questionnaire is, is it fairly accurate? If, if someone scores above 14, you know, would you say it's a fairly good maneuver to consider MCAS therapies? And if someone is below 10, then they may want to look elsewhere or, or does it not have that high of a correlation? You know, how would you comment on that? So I think in my experience, I would say that uh, if the score is high enough, then um, the likelihood is increased and, uh, and they need a, you know, a full workup. And these are the patients that, let's just say, on the first round of testing, they, you know, we put them through blood, we put them through urine, let's say, and we don't get an answer. But on the scoring system and their clinical history, it just, just seems impossible that they, they don't have this. You know, sometimes it will take two or three rounds or maybe more till we've confined you know, the, the level that's, that's elevated. And the reason that is is because these uh, things that we're measuring, they're, they're the mediators, they're the chemicals basically found in the mast cell that are released. And so, number one, you could catch it on a day when the mast cells are actually calmer and are not releasing those chemicals. It could be that those chemicals we know actually are very heat sensitive. And so they, everything needs to be kept cold. And so if the littlest bit of the, of the sample gets a little warm, it will degrade. And so then you might not get it. And so, so I would say that you use that scoring system as a way to justify continuing to look for this. Now on the flip side, if the level is low, um, the, on, the, on the scoring system, let's say they score five and, um, and you're sort of thinking, well, there's some pieces of this that doesn't, do sound like mast cell, but yet, you know, their scores are, are fairly low, then I would say, you know, I think it's still worth, you're going to still, I'm going to still um, screen them because I just know in my patient population how, how 
hypochondriasis is, but um, I'm also going to think about things that are going to kind of mimic this. You know, this is a multi-system disease and there are other multi-system diseases that need to be looked at. And so I might say, you know, this, the, the story has some, some MCAS flavor to it, but we're going to, and we're going to look for that, but we're, now we're going to also rule out some other processes. And I would say that, that in my experience, one of the things that seems to uh, mimic um, some of the symptoms of mast cell activation syndrome is Lyme disease. Hmm. And now Lyme disease can cause mast cell activation syndrome and any infection actually can do that. Environmental exposures, there are various things that kind of kick up the mast cells for them to react. But uh, uh, there are patients who have Lyme disease who do not have MCAS, and, uh, but yet they definitely have some overlap in the symptomatology. Yep. No, that, that makes complete sense. And that's actually very helpful to, uh, to, you know, to, to at least have the, the questionnaire partially guide where to investigate. Cause I think as clinicians, we're all trying to make sure that we bark up the right tree as much as possible and bark up the wrong tree as least as possible. And so whatever we have to guide along that process, I, I think is, is, is very helpful. Hey everyone, let's talk about one of my favorite tests for digestive health, the GI map from Diagnostic Solutions, who has helped to make this podcast possible. Now, if you've been reading any of the case studies that I've published in the Future of Functional Medicine Review Clinical Newsletter, you've likely seen that this test, the GI map, is a test I frequently use in my practice. Why? Well, one of my favorite things about this test is it has excellent insurance coverage. So this is a few hundred dollars I save patients. This lab is also CLIA certified, which is essentially the Quality Assurance Bureau for labs. So it's important that these labs are being monitored, not cutting any corners. That's where you get your CLIA certification. Now, this test uses quantitative PCR technology, so it's a DNA test. And you'll get a good read on dysbiosis with this test because they will assess and report out various types of bacteria, yeast, and parasites, including protozoa, worms, and amoebas. They also have some valuable and helpful clinical markers like calprotectin, which can help rule in or out inflammatory bowel disease, and zonulin, a marker of leaky gut. So head over to diagnosticsolutionslab.com, diagnosticsolutionslab.com, to learn more and to order your test. Um, One question I wanted to ask you from earlier, if you see only one system of symptomatic presentation, would you write off the possibility of MCAS? Uh, so if, for example, only gastrointestinal or only neurological? No, I still wouldn't. Um, and I, especially neurological, um, because, uh, you know, what's interesting about uh, the nervous system is that uh, the neurons, all the, basically, I, I think of them as wires in our, in our body, in our nervous system, those wires are surrounded by mast cells. The mast cells protect the nervous system from things that are bad, those pathogens that could come in, bacteria or fungus or parasites or toxins. And so they're there waiting to defend um, the, the nerves. And in, in cases where we see uh, neurologic sequelae that, that look like um, depression, anxiety, neuropathies, OCD behaviors, there there are a variety of them that you can get. Um, I still think you need to keep this on the radar. I think you need to look because, because again, in my experience, it's unusual for a patient that I'm seeing to have only one system involved. And so they may come in, let's say, with the history of they want to get their, their anxiety and they want to get their anxiety under control. That's how they start, right? And said, okay, what else is going on? Nothing, nothing. You know, sometimes they'll say they don't have any other symptoms. And yet when you start digging, yeah, you have to prove them. Yeah. yeah, they don't think about constipation as an issue, or they don't think about, you know, some, I guess, subtle symptoms that I guess they've lived with for a long time that are really, truly really their norm, but it's not really normal, sure. right? Yep, yep. So, no, I, I um, think that, that makes complete sense. Yeah, because you're right. And constipation is a good example of that. Some people go to the bathroom twice a week and they think that that's normal. And, and there's, you know, some debate as to whether or not that is or is not normal. But just as a general example, they may not even mention that because they've come to think of that as normal or they're just so habituated to it. They don't even think of that as a symptom anymore. Exactly. Now, you also mentioned uh, methylation and histamine. And, you know, th- this the methylation support may be something that's more unique to histamine intolerance than it is MCAS per se. But I'm I'm wondering in your delving in that realm, are are there any, you know, key takeaways that you would offer patients to consider regarding 
facilitating methylation as a potential initial level therapy? Well, I think that, um, you know, this may be old news, but I do like to screen all my patients for the MTHFR mutation. And um, you know, that's the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase um, that affects folic acid and, and vitamin B12 metabolism. Base, that's the basic things that affects methylation. It's one of many, many genes involved in methylation. So it almost feels a little bit like uh, just looking at one thing is probably not going to be enough, but it does give me a little glimpse into the fact that there, there are patients who are going to have maybe a little bit more difficult time with methylation if they have one of the two mutations or polymorphisms that are associated with that. So um, I like to screen it. Um, I'll do a homocysteine level, which will give me a good sense also of their methylation potential. And, um, and then, you know, I'll look at supporting them with, you know, supplement, supplementation. The issue is that um, there's no question that my mast cell patients um, are more sensitive to supplements and they're very sensitive to the fillers. And so, you know, whereas, you know, uh, another patient, I could, you know, they can walk out of my clinic on methyl cobalamin B12, um, methyl folate, I can put them on a fish oil and a probiotic, and I can give them like my basic regimen, and they'll be fine. Um, these patients, everything has to be started one at a time. Um, I need to kind of eliminate any, any fillers that may be an issue for them, although we may not know for that patient what the filler is that's a problem. Um, and sometimes methylate them that while they need it can sometimes overactivate the mast cells and so it's a little bit more challenging but on the other hand when when you enter, enter this piece of it to the to their treatment plan it can make a big difference it's just about you have to be very patient and and do it you know low and slow but um but adding b12 to somebody who is fatigued because of their mcas um and they're not detoxing well and there are all these other symptoms right can be can be really helpful now with with the supplements do you find is there a certain line of supplements that you find to be MCAS friendly, or is it just very individual from filler to filler, from supplement to supplement? Yeah, it, it, unfortunately it, it is, you know, I, I've, I manufacture a lot of my supplements um, because I'm always looking for the purest and the, the, the supplements with the least you know, amount of fillers. Um, but even still, you know, sometimes we have to compound certain nutrients or certain, well, for medications for sure, but sometimes we have to go that route where there is almost no filler in anything. Uh, so we eliminate that possibility and, and hope that the pure form of whatever we're giving them is going to be tolerated. So, you know, it's a little, um, it's not always that obvious. Each patient does seem to be very, very different. Okay. Now, Let's let's discuss treatment, and I know there's probably a few different ways that we can go here, but uh, maybe we can start with the, for lack of a better term, least invasive, most common treatments that you find helpful, and then and then kind of work our way up. And and the first one I just wanted to ask you about was time release vitamin C, and and, and uh, you know vitamin C can be helpful, but the one thing that I've noticed, especially with histamine intolerant patients, is they tend toward diarrhea, and so. Vitamin C might be a problem because it's also a laxative, and and I've just started experimenting with time release vitamin C, and, and I'm hoping that not only will that have a more consistent effect on on you know, histamine in the mast cells, but it will not cause the diarrheal type reaction. But I, I haven't been using this long enough to be able to comment, and I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts. When you say time release, I just want to clarify: Are you release? talking about sustain? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Where they put they put a filler in to make it you know, go in slower, basically, Precise, right? precisely, or, like, or even like an ester C that might be uh, time released. That's kind of what you're, what you're talking about. Exactly. About, and right? and I, I just came across this in one of Afrin's papers, probably two or three months ago. And I found a, I believe it's a um, sustained release from now brand. Um, and I'm not sure if the mechanism is some type of coating or some type of filler. And you probably know more about this than I do, but yeah, I mean, please illuminate me on, on whatever thoughts you have here. Yeah. So, you know, the truth is that, um, I've not specifically seen sustained release necessarily be better. Again, it's, it's going to be an individual thing. What I have found, um, in a number of patients is that giving small doses of even the, you know, immediate release, it 
in throughout the day, um, you know, maybe every few hours, especially if I'm using that to control their histamine, um, can be very, very helpful. And so if you, if they develop diarrhea, then clearly that's too much for them. And sometimes it, that is kind of a good symptom to rely on because you'll know that you're just, that's just too much and you back off. But, you know, I have a patient right now that we're treating like this who really is on already a lot of antihistamines and a lot of other meds. And she has, she, she, developed some kind of viral illness that really knocked her down and knocked her mast cells out of whack. And um, now we're, we're trying to, you know, kind of control her immune system and boost her immune system in a sense and control the mast cells. And so we're using small doses of, of a powdered vitamin C. So they're less fillers. And, um, and she does that every couple of hours through the day and, and really has tolerated quite well. Whereas in the past, if she would just take a big dose of vitamin C, she would, she would have some GI effects from that. So I've been doing that more, again, dosing low and slow and building up uh, from there, you know, every few days just to kind of see how they're doing. Gotcha. Okay. That, that makes sense. Yep. And then, you know, I guess, where do you, where do you start? I, I kind of want to give you the floor yeah. for, for however you want to guide people through starting into the therapy. And, and um, we, we, we have a mix of lay people who might be talking with their well-intentioned doctor who's trying to work with them. And we may have some clinicians who are fairly new to this. So whatever you want to share with us in terms of steering that process, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. So look, I think that while I always like to have a diagnosis before I embark on a treatment plan, some of the things that we're talking about are innocuous. They're not they're not going to be dangerous. They, you know, people may have a reaction to them, um, but but the point is that some people out there might say, you know, I don't know if I have this. You know, are some of the things that Dr. Dempsey's talking about? You know, is it okay to to try? And so, I think there are some things here that if you can find a brand that's you know highly um, you know monitored and and um, pharmaceutical grade or or professional grade, you know. You're, it's, probably it's okay and safe to, let's say, try vitamin C or try something like quercetin. You know, there are certain things that even without a diagnosis, some people might just say, you know what, I'm just curious if that would help me. But I always encourage people to go out there and actually, you know, get the diagnosis. It will just help target um, this issue better, right? You'll have more options to choose from. But I think that, you know, where I start really has to do with how sick the patient is. So, you know, the patients are coming in and they are you know, disabled. They are reacting all day long. They're, they have to wear masks to, to leave their house because they react to every scent, every um, thing in the, in the environment. If they you know, can't walk because they're weak and they're, they get rashes constantly and they have lost 30 pounds because of this illness, you know, there's so many things that I see in my, in my office that, you know, that's not somebody that I'm going to, you know, start on vitamin C. I mean, I, of course, I, at some point I'm going to get them on there, but that's somebody who I'm going to, I, I need to get this under control quickly. And, um, and they're going to need you know, what we call H1 and H2 blockers. So those are pharmaceutical or pharmacologic treatments. H1 is, um, is a histamine blocker that blocks a certain histamine receptor in the body. And it blocks the histamine receptors that are often found in the respiratory tract. It's actually found everywhere, but, but that's the, those are the the drugs that you know people take for allergies very often. So, you know, the name brands like Claritin, Zyrtec, Allegra, you know, we want to get them on something like that. And, and sometimes they need Benadryl or stronger drugs because their reactions are so severe that we've got to, you know, gamble it down so that they can can to, you know tolerate it and and um, and get to the next step uh, in treatment. So we've got to uh, do start with that. I'll often combine that with something called an H2 blocker. So an H2 blocker is a histamine blocker, um, that, but it's a specific type of receptor that is mostly found in the GI tract. And those are drugs like Pepsid and Zantac and Tagamet. You know, we've been taught in the integrative functional medicine world that a lot of these medications that reduce stomach acid are bad. Um, because they can affect absorption of our nutrients, they can affect bones, etc. But in this case, it's very important. It's a very important part of treatment. And you know, what we hope is that patients are not going to need this for the rest of their lives. 
but it's, it's important. I, I have a lot of patients who have very, are very fearful of using medications like this. And I just like to you know, reassure that, you know, there, these are drugs that have been on the market for a long time and they really do work. And when they're combined together, so the allergy medicines, along with the stomach acid reducers, they um, block the histamine from a couple of different angles and uh, can really help you know, the response and the, and the, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that, that you made that, that comment because that is something that patients struggle with. And, um, just, uh, you know, my, my comment on this is the, the H2 antagonists aren't nearly as powerful at lowering stomach acid as the PPI medications are. And I think oftentimes patients are taking information illustrating negative side effects of long-term use of PPIs, which are more powerful at lowering stomach acid and then conflating that with the H2 antagonists. Um, I'm not sure, you know, would, would you agree with that? Would you modify that at all? Yeah, no, no, you're correct. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ruscio. I quickly wanted to fill you in on the three main resources that are available to you in case you need help or would like to learn more. Of course, I see patients both via telemedicine, via Skype, and also at my physical practice in Walnut Creek, California. There is, of course, my book, Healthy Good, Healthy You, which gives you what I think is one of the best self-help protocols for optimizing your gut health and, of course, understanding why your gut is so important and so massively impactful on your overall health. And then finally, if you're a clinician trying to learn more about my functional medicine approach, there is the Future of Functional Medicine Review, which is a monthly newsletter, which is a training tool to help sharpen clinical skills. All of the information for all three of these is available at the URL drrushow.com slash resources. And in case you're on the go, that link is available in the description on all of your podcast players. Okay, back to the show. And and the other thing I'm wondering, do you notice, I, I'm noticing there tends to be more of a predilection for people having what what appears to be presumed hyperacidity when they when they have histamine intolerance. I can't say for mass cell activation syndrome because I, I, you know, I don't mm-hmm. get that deep. But my thinking is some of these people with with uh, this this facilitation of histamine may skew toward the higher end of acid production anyway, and this may be getting them back toward a more physiological normal. I mean, uh, ostensibly. It's, yeah, it's possible. I've, I've actually I've not seen you know really any data on that, so it's hard to say. But it's, there's no question that a lot of mast cell patients have uh, reflux or what they you know that they've been diagnosed with reflux. So the assumption is that they do have some stomach acid that, you know, that is refluxing up into the esophagus. And so this might, you know, this might help a little bit. Um, Yeah. Uh, But, you know, more importantly, it's really helping, you know, the whole system. So what we know is that while this is working at the level of, let's say, the stomach and the H1 blockers are working all over the body, but also in in the respiratory tract, that has a systemic effect. And so when histamine is blocked, what we hope happens is that the mast cells, it's like a feedback, the mast cells hopefully will realize that they need to just calm down and not to produce more histamine. Gotcha. And that's, that's sort of why these things work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, beyond blocking histamine, which is sort of how we start, so either we're going to start pharmacologically or we're going to start nutraceutically, you know, we're, we're going to use, let's say, the, like you mentioned, vitamin C or, or quercetin, and there are a few others. I'll go through some of the others that we use. But really what we want to do ultimately is to stabilize that mast cell. And there are ways to do that, um, again, both pharmacologically and uh, nutraceutically. And uh, one of the most important, I guess I'll call it, I don't want it's not a medicine, but one of the most important things that we use that can accomplish that is, um, is quercetin, which has actually been studied head to head with medication and has been shown to not only act as an antihistamine, but also to stabilize mast cells. So, you know, again, ultimately, I just want to get those mast cells from, from, from degranulating, releasing all their, all their contents. So um, quercetin is on, on one side, but can be used really in, in, in many ways. And then on the other side, on the pharmacologic side, um, is chromalin, chromalin sodium, which is, uh, can be a very helpful drug for a lot of patients. But I always have to make the distinction that, you know, what works for one person 
doesn't work, necessarily work for another person. So I have patients where chromalin was the life changing thing for them, and um, and you know they can't imagine ever going off it because it, it really is something that is life saving. On the other hand, I have other patients who can't tolerate it at all, and it's the worst thing they've ever tried. Mm. So what I've learned is that you've got to you, know, you have to be systematic. You got to try. You have to see what the, re- the response is. If it's not tolerated, you stop. Or if, if it doesn't do much after a few months, you stop and you move and you move on. And so, uh, in the mast cell stabilizing category, we have quercetin, we have chromalin, so those can be tried. Um, we have a drug called ketotifen, which is compounded and, and can also be helpful. It has both some antihistamine properties and also mast cell stabilizing. And then there are you know, a variety of other things that, uh, that we can use. So if we want to talk the non-pharmacologic side of things, um, NAC and acetylcysteine um, we often use as a, as a way to both um, – basically break down histamine, supports the liver, but also seems to have some stabilizing effects. And so I, I, you know, I use that along with alpha lipoic acid. And then, you know, one of my, probably one of my favorite um, supplements, which is really directing the uh, breakdown of histamine is diamine oxidase, which is an enzyme that, um, that digests histamine down in the gut. And we use that a fair amount to help both control histamine in the food the histamine response in the gut, but probably has more far-reaching effects systemically. So we're, you know, we, we do have a lot of um, options. And so again, if the pa- patient is, uh, you know, a, a milder case. Now, when I say mild, it doesn't mean that they're not affected by this tremendously, but they're in a position where I can, you know, trial and error this through, and and I might start a little bit on the more natural side. You know, that's what I do. But in the patients that you know have more severe symptoms, I've got. To but bring out the big guns first, calm things down. And then what we hope is over time, we're going to be able to figure out if they can tolerate some of these other things. Right. No, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, something interesting just, just to add here is a paper was recently published showing that a low histamine diet could actually increase the diamine oxidase levels after, I believe it was after four weeks. And so I thought this was very good news because what this suggests is a low histamine diet may allow the resurrection of of enzyme production. And, and part of this may be through healing of the intestinal lining. What, what, what may happen, and, and I'm, I'm drawing an inference here, but what may happen is a low, low histamine diet allows a degree of, of repair of the gut lining, which produces the DAO enzyme to break down histamine. And after a while on the low histamine diet, it seems that people may have a, a better ability to produce that enzyme. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it makes sense to me. Yeah, no, it completely makes sense. And this this may also be part of the reason why at least one paper has shown a, a low FODMAP diet can lead to a reduction of histamine because a low FODMAP diet may also allow a degree of, of healing of the gut lining. Yeah, and I, and I think that we can say that about a lot of these diets out there. We can say that about the, the low lectin diet, which is a lot of uh, press lately. You know, we think now that the lectins in a lot of these natural foods that we think are healthy are actually really breaking down the gut wall and causing more, you know, leaky guts. So so diet is really critical for everything we do. And regarding diet, would you say there's um, a couple diets that you find are are more of your go-to or beneficial diets? So this this may be a little controversial, but I'll tell you what I think is really working for a lot of my patients. And I think some of your listeners are will be shocked, but um, one of the things that I, I believe is that um, as, as uh, human beings, um, we can very easily digest animal proteins and animal fats more than we can digest plant based foods. And so um, I am now running a study. I have a number of patients who are, have entered the study and um, we are looking at uh, what I would call a carnivore diet, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where they're eating primarily, we're talking, you know, grass fed, organic, you know, good sources of animal protein, right? We're not talking conventional, you know, feedlot stuff. And, um, and we're finding that their mast cell symptoms, their histamines and all that have gone down dramatically in just a very short period of time. And so, and I think that speaks to the fact that, that the gut has time to repair 
because we, again, have more enzymes, more availability to, to break down the animal proteins and animal fats than we do, let's say, plants. Plants have, let's say, cellulose. Um, we don't, as humans, have cellulase enzymes to break that down. And while we're trying to break it down, it's roughage. I think that that can irritate the gut. And so, you know, going back to what you said about the DAO enzyme and, and maybe builds up after the gut repairs, that these are patients who initially really had to had maybe five or six foods that they could safely eat because they were so reactive to everything. And, and it felt like every week they had to eliminate another food because they would start reacting to that. And, and so we, we were struggling to find the right diet for them because it was beyond just low histamine. Like we were like, okay, it's low histamine. And it was low FODMAP and then it was something else. And, and then I said, you know, I, I think we need to try, we have to go back to basics. And, um, you know, we, they started with meats that were fresh, you know, no leftovers because leftovers will have more histamine. Uh-huh. And so this is fresh meat, grass fed, cook that day, and slowly their symptoms started getting better and better. And they still know that that leftovers, if they eat the leftover burger from the night before, it's going to be a problem for them. But generally, their ability to to get energy from, from their food, to feel good, to go through a day without re- reacting um, and without feeling bad and not breathing. You know, one patient was, was having all, all anaphylaxis every other day practically. And, um, and to go from that to breathing, you know, what she would say when she'd come into the clinic is, I can breathe. You know, we, we underestimate, right, how, like what breathing does for us, and we take for granted what breathing does for us, right? So we don't think about it. I'm sitting here talking. I'm not thinking about my breathing. But this, this patient went through every day thinking about her breathing because it just wasn't right. She never felt good. And, and then she follows a diet like this, and then, you know, wow, <laughs> she's breathing. So um, I really like to think about, you know, what – as human beings, we are really meant to eat. If we look at anthropologic data, if we look at evolutionary da- evolutionary data, and I think there's like no question. You know, we can argue the political factors and the environmental factors separately because I know there's a, this is more there's more to the story there. But I think if I'm trying to heal my patients, honestly, eating foods that we're meant to eat in this carn- carnivore diet uh, does seem to, to really make a big difference. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned the carnivore diet. It, it's something that I think our, 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 our audience is, is probably heard about and is, is certainly open-minded too, given the kind of paleo and ancestral topics that we touch on oftentimes uh, on the show. And, and I've, I've commented before that I, I see the utility in the carnivore diet as kind of another version of an elimination diet. And and would it be something I'd want someone on forever? No, I'd like to have someone be on the broadest diet possible and have the least restrictions as the end game. But sometimes you have to start down the road of a restrictive diet to allow healing to occur. And, and I see the, again, the carnivore diet as, as being a, a way of cutting out many of the noxious compounds that occur in foods because many of the, the elimination diets we use are cutting out different groups of plant foods, low lectin, low oxalate, low histamine, low FODMAP, um, even low saponin. So a lot of these things are, are food count, or I'm sorry, are, are vegetable um, based plant based compounds and and so I, I see the utility and it's interesting to hear that you're you're seeing the same thing with uh, with this you know highly sensitive subset of, of patients on uh, on the MCAS spectrum and, and and is there a certain length of time that you're having people you know generally do this before you start to do a reintroduction? Well, so I think that that there's. I mean, I'll be the first to say that I think that um, we're all individuals and. Um, and I don't want to go so far as to say that everyone should be doing this forever. Having said that, I think for some patients, they'll benefit for much longer periods of time than we would use for a, a different type of elimination diet. Uh, there are some people out there who have done, they're not, they're not my patients, but they talk about this in the, in the media that they've been doing things like this for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, um, eating strictly you know, uh, meat only and they you know seem healthy and I can't attest to that because I haven't done their blood work or anything but I think that uh, it, it certainly doesn't seem to be much harm 
for, for a lot of people. And I don't know, I really don't know what the right amount of time is. I will say that I've had patients do it for six months. And um, after six months feel like they're quote unquote cured. Um, and they feel like they can then take that diet and start introducing it. And, and maybe they revert to like a more paleo or primal diet where there is, there are some plant-based foods, but they figured out which ones they can tolerate. Um, and so I've, we've seen that. And, and, and we've seen patients who, you know, maybe can only do this for a month or a few weeks just because maybe it's just too limiting for them. It's, it feels like they're losing out on, on life. They don't have the variety that they want. I mean, there are lots of reasons why people would choose to do it less, less amount of time. And, and there are people who are going to do it more, but I'm very intrigued by it. And I think that, um, you know, that's why I think we we need to study this and, and really know, you know, what is the optimal amount of time? Should this be forever or should this just be used, you know, like you said, like an elimination diet for a period of time. Sure. And, and also, you know, I, I should mention, I think the audience already knows this, but uh, I, I went through a very exhaustive review of the literature in my book about the pros and cons of fiber consumption. And I was quite shocked to see that while fiber is purported to be this health promoting component of food, the data is showing that fiber higher fiber consumption correlates with decreased colorectal cancer, decreased cancers at large, decreased all-cause mortality. It, it's really split and, and there's really not consistent data showing that you need to have fiber in your diet in order to be healthy, which I found comforting knowing that some patients, especially with IBS and IBD, don't do well on anything other than a small amount of fiber in their diet. So it was nice to see that at least when looking at the evidence objectively, you won't be doing any disservice to yourself by reducing your fiber consumption. Now, these weren't studies going all the way to the carnivore level of fiber consumption, but that that trend is there nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fascinating, and I and I hope we can learn more about it. Yeah, same here. Um, well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Is there anything that you'd like to mention and close? And then also, will you please tell people if you have a website or a book or, or about your clinic, you know, anywhere you'd like to make people aware of or direct them to, please mention that also. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, the take home message is really that, you know, if you're listening, and you've, you know, you're not sure what's going on, and you've, you've seen, you know, different doctors, and you're, you're on a path, you're trying to get better, but you're, you know, you don't have, you just still don't know what's going on. Talk to your doctors about um, testing you for this, you know, educate them, have them, you know, read about it. Um, I, I write a lot, Dr. Afrin and I both write a lot on this. We, we've been blogging. Um, we have a, you know, a, a Facebook page that we've been you know, writing on as well. Um, our whole goal is to educate. And so we're here to help physicians out there who are trying to help their patients and don't know where to go. And I'm trying to direct those patients to, you know, to, um, to get the help that they need. So I'm always, um, I'm, I'm always advocating for patients to, to help themselves. It's unfortunate that sometimes patients have to do that and can't always rely on their physicians, but um, some phys- physicians can't know everything. But so, you know, go down the path, talk to them, provide information. My, my, um, my website is www.drdrtanyadempsey dot com, um, my Facebook page, Dr. Tony Dempsey, and um, and there's a lot of information. We have a um, a weekly ask the MCAS experts uh, question and answer time. So we that we're blogging on, and um, we have people um, post questions on Facebook, and Dr. Afton and I prepare the answers, and um, and that's been that's been great. We've got a great response uh, from that, and we're really just trying to to help and get the word out. Um, so that's uh, you know that's how you find me, and, um, and that's my that's my story. Awesome. Well, well, thank you. And we've referred a handful of patients over to your clinic because like I said on the podcast before, you know, if, if you don't feel like you've given this topic adequate study and knowing the meticulous nature that some of the testing can require and how sensitive patients can be and, and how diligent and meticulous you have to be with trying to craft your program, I think it's not a bad idea to refer to an MCAS specialist if you're highly suspicious. Um, but hopefully this podcast has given you some ammo to arm you in, in the therapeutic process if you want to undergo that yourself or guide your doctor to it and also giving you a, a clinic to plug into if you're in need of some help in a referral. So Tanya, thank you again for taking the time. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks All for right. having me. My pleasure. Take care. 
Thank you for listening to Dr. Ruscio Radio today. Check us out on iTunes and leave a review. Visit drruscio.com to ask a question for an upcoming podcast, post comments for today's show, and sign up to receive weekly updates. That's drruscio.com.